Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Friday Fireside Chat. Uh, I'm Rita McGrath, as most of you probably know. I am joined here today by Martin Lindstrom, uh, who is a guru, a branding expert, uh, someone who I can say has really changed the course of many companies' fates um, and is a real go-to person on how to be positive, how to understand what's going on with consumers. Uh, his previous books include Biology, which was B-U-Y-O-L-G, O-L-O-G-Y, uh, which was, a, I think it was a New York Times bestseller, wasn't it? And, uh, it was, I was really lucky there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So anyway, Martin, welcome, welcome. Um, I don't know if you'd like to say anything to our- And thank you for putting on the fireplace for me. That was really important. I did, I did. Yeah. I, I, you know, was, I was getting ready to, to sign on and Martin and I had discussed this a couple of weeks ago. He said, when I come back for a fireside chat, that fireplace better be on. <laughs> <laughs> it is on behind me and it's lovely because it's really cold here today. So that's nice. So um, I thought I'd like to kick off with just a story from your growing up when you actually had the audacity to build a Lego playground and charge people for the privilege of seeing it. And you were what, 12 or something? Richard, don't call it a playground. It was a theme park in my <laughs> mind, okay? Let's, okay? let's get the story right here. Yeah, it's true. I, I mean, I was, I'll tell you some, some funny things. I was a huge Lego fan and I was such a big fan that I actually built my own bed in Lego and slept in it for a year. Which, by the way, is anyone want to be inspired by that? Don't do it because you wake up every morning with dots on your back, which is not very... <laughs> you didn't get a mattress on it or anything? <laughs> no, I was a hardcore Lego fan, right? <laughs> so, of course, I plucked straight into the bricks, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's hardcore. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I built up my own Lego land when I was uh, 12 years of age. And, and um, I was serious. I'll tell you about what I did. I actually got a sponsorship from Sony. Can you believe it or not? Huh. And that, well, it's true. And I went to Japan to learn how to call uh, to cut bonsai trees. Um, God knows how I persuaded these guys to do it. So I took about a year to, to develop my theme park. And then I opened it up um, in the summer of, two, in summer of 1982, it must have been. And um, only two people showed up, my mom and my dad, which really was the lowest point of my career. Aww. So I... Yeah, it was. It was. It was. It was not good. I have to say, one dollar each. So it was two dollars in the box there. But <laughs> so I went down to the local print office and I persuaded them to sponsor me, and they were really kind. I think actually they really felt sorry for me. I think that was the reality. But so they put a paper, no, an ad in the paper, and two days later I had one hundred and thirty-one visitors showing up. Only problem was that. Visitor number 130 and visitor number 131 were the lawyers from Lego suing me. And I'm not kidding. They said to me, it's our brand. And I said to them, I bought the boxes. It's my brand. Um, and then we had a little bit of an argument. And the owner of Lego heard about this story, kid you not. And he literally drew in his car from Billund, which is where Lego is from in Denmark. I'm born in Denmark. And he came to my mom and dad's house. And Rita, I just wanted you to have this in perspective. This is important for everyone to understand. You know, Villa Wonka Chocolate Factory, that whole story, right? This is Villa Wonka Chocolate Factory all over again. You have the owner of Lego coming, visiting a 12-year-old kid. So he hears about the story and he basically negotiates the ultimate dream job, which is to work for Lego. So I became the, the youngest kid back then working for Lego at the age of 12. And um, what's so funny about this story is a lot of things coming out of it. But one of them were that many years later, I asked the folks at Lego, why did you employ me? I mean, seriously, right? And they said to me, it was the first time we realized we lost contact with the consumer. And we thought, why don't we employ the consumer to understand the world through their eyes? And that really has stopped with me ever since. And it's such an inspiring um, theme throughout your book. So the new book is The Ministry of Common Sense. I have been enjoying it this week ever since it was derived. Thank you for staff. buying it, by the way. At least one person is buying it, right? Was this really good start? This takes one, right? I mean, if you only had two customers for your theme park, right? So you've got at least one paying customer. It's definitely your... And I've been earmarking it and, and so forth. Uh, but one of the things that I found most interesting in the book was this idea that companies hire you, and I've, I find this as well in my own work, companies will hire you and they'll say things like, 
ah, oh, you know, the problem around here is communication. If we could just get communication right, that would be great. And in my younger years, what I would do is I would earnestly study up on communication and I'd read every HBR article written on the topic and I'd call all my friends that were communication consultants and I'd arrive at the firm and it would turn out that there was actually a CEO succession underway and the three VPs who were, you know, in line to one of them was going to be picked. Um, they, there was no communication problem. They communicated perfectly. They just hated each other's guts. And they were fighting with each other, which you touch on in your book in terms of politics. So, but this theme of, you know, you, you ostensibly get brought in to fix a brand and what actually happens is you find you have to change the organization. It, it is, it's a classic uh, no, issue here because what happens is that, I think the issue is the closer you are to the forest, the less you can see the trees for the forest. And I, I, I do think this is an issue for comedies as they grow older. Here's what I've learned. I've learned that if you take an entrepreneurial company, let's take a quick story. Two young kids off their heads smoking weeds in a dorm room. And, and then one day the kid is shooting a photo of his friend and uploaded on social and everything goes berserk. And mom and dad is furious. And of course, he says, I wish I could retract this photo. And that later on became Snapchat, a, you know, a $50 billion company. And um, what happened in that moment was kind of a sense of empathy. And remember, empathy is the ability to place yourself in the shoes of another person's uh, you know, point of view and feel what that person is feeling. And that's what they did. That's what entrepreneurial companies almost always do. And that feeling is such a strong drive that it takes you through the evolution of the company as it grows. But here's what's happening. As companies grow, the founders aside, you know, real, you know, think about Google, um, the companies certainly have lawyers and legal functions and, and, and all that stuff coming on board. The study, they slowly disconnect from an outside in point of view to an inside out point of view where the world they deal with is no longer the customer world. It's their own little world of compliance, which become real. And I think the best example of that is when I you know, was spending a lot of time with one of the largest banks in the world, which really had that problem you're talking about. <laughs> and I went to the 29th floor to talk to the head of compliance. And she was a lovely lady. And I said to her, how long time have you worked here? She said, I worked here for 17 years. And I said, so what is your number one um, deliverable? She said, I produced 1,271 rules. And I thought, well, that's wonderful. I said, so and she immediately took this yellow pages book like thing device, slammed it in front of mine on my lap. And I was flicking through all these rules and that was a lot of rules he writes. And I landed at page 200 and something while she was talking about her you know, goal of creating rules. And the rule was saying something like, whenever you have a signed contract, do always ensure to post it, to email it and to send it by fax. And I said to her, do you have a fax machine? She said, no looked at me like a deer in the headlight. I said, well, that's a rule. Why don't you get rid of the rules? He said, why should I? I mean, I'm paid to produce rules, not to delete my own work. And I think that's kind of symptomatic for what's happened with the companies. They suddenly become so engraved in their own you know, red tape that that straight jacket becomes so tight that they can't see the world from multiple points of view. Empathy disappears, is now flipped to nonsense because that's the opposite of common sense, of course. And then suddenly uh, we end up with the problem you talk about. Our, our brand doesn't work. Our product doesn't work. But in reality, their point of view is just wrong. Mm. Well, and you, you are in the book, you, you say that the, the somebody put a price tag on the economic cost of out of date rules. And it was something like $15 billion. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, that's yeah. just mind blowing. It, it is um, mind blowing. And it is a, a good indication of how we become collectively blind. I mean, you remember the story about how to kill a frog. Either you have to boil it, throw it into hot water, or else it slowly, you slowly heat up the pot. And this is what's happening in comedy is we slowly heat up the pot. So we don't see all those different um, layers of complexity we add to it. In fact, it's very interesting. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, uh, Rita, but there's a study done, published study done in Australia called Safety Clutter. 
And safety clutter is the concept of that we love to justify our existence through creating safety guidelines. And the study literally shows that 65% are something like that of all safety rules and regulations and guidelines and what have you really is just made up. It, it doesn't add any value. It just creates clutter because it's a way for us to justify our existence and our roles. And I would say that safety clutter is not alone. There's a lot of other things called bureaucracy clutter and compliance clutter. And <laughs> what those, yeah. You know what I think of a lot is when you get some, I don't know, a headphone or a, or a computer mouse. I just bought one the other day or, you know, whatever. And, and the box has all these like, like safety things in it, the, 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 the safety information guide, or you're opening a manual to an employee, to a appliance in the first yeah. you know, 10 pages is don't plug this thing in, in the bathtub, you know, yeah. stuff like that. And you just yeah. look at it and you go, I know they've got to include it there, but really does any, it's like the, the, the air flight instructions where they show you how to buckle your seatbelt. You know? <laughs> It's like, it, it's, and, and who are the honestly who are they doing it for? Um, right, right. Because what happens is the wallpaper effect kicks in here. You know, you don't see the wallpaper in the end. Uh, the only people seeing it are those people who are doing this because the only thing they're focused on is finding. Oh, you you used the wrong word, right? Um, so what happens is that what actually was probably made in good intentions disappeared. And I think a good way of illustrating that is, is really many, many years ago, um, when I was 19 or something like that, I, I don't know why, but I started to uh, investigate fire departments to understand how fire works, how smoke works, <laughs> and, as you do when you're 19. I don't know why I did it. But what I realized, of course, is we all know that smoke goes up. You will know that in your fireplace here. And of course, no, it's all clear down at the bottom. So I... I asked myself this fundamental question, if smoke goes up, how come all fire exits are on the top? Why are they not on the, on the bottom, near the floor? And that was later introduced in Sweden, and then we introduced it in Japan. And I do remember when it was introduced, people had this extreme um, fear of implementing, well, we can't do it, it will not work, it will be rejected, why should you? But the common sense was smoke goes up. No one will look up through the cloud and see that it's exit up and take the head down like, like a giraffe. And this is really the essence of it. Quite often, you know, I come from Denmark. In Denmark, we have Hans Christian Andersen, and he wrote a fairy tale called The Empire of New Clothes. And the little kid is saying he doesn't have any clothes on, he's naked. Well, I do kind of feel like that boy saying that to the world. Why do you have the fire exits up there? Why do you do what you do in the organization? Because people can't say it or they don't dare to say it or they simply can't see it. Mm -hmm. So one of my favorite of your stories is about your television remote control. And I don't know if you've got the prop there with you today, but uh, I do have a prop here. Do you? Okay. <laughs> Well, tell us about your remote control, because I think it's just, it's one of the best examples I know that just makes it very visible to people. Well, <laughs> what, the what worst thing there in which people, well thank you. Well, the worst thing about this story is it's true. So everything <laughs> you hear about is true. So I am in Miami. I'm watching television, or rather uh, I try to, because I have this remote control, and here it is. And it, it's almost like a space shuttle, which can take off. It has three numerical keyboards. It has six arrows going up and down to the left and slightly to the left. It has A, B, C, D. I have no idea what it means. And then the, the, the final touch of this is it doesn't have one, but it has two on buttons. And I'm not sure how it works if you press the first one, the television switch on, and the second one is extra, extra super unnatural on, I, I, something like that. Anyway, I managed to switch on the television, feeling like a complete idiot that I don't know how a remote control works. Watch Donald Trump for about five minutes, get enough of that, try to switch it off. And I'm saying try to switch it off because there's two off buttons on this remote control. And the first one, when I click the first one, literally the light dims in the room in a kind of a nice, moody, sexy way. And as I press the second one, the air conditioning system switches off. But my television, of course, is still running with Donald Trump on. So here I am sitting in panic. So I'm sort of jumping under the table like an idiot with my bomb in the air, unplug the whole thing, the mini bar, the, the lamp, and of course the television. And this is really my story because here's the issue. As I'm sitting there, I really feel like a complete idiot. How, 
I, have I become so old, Martin, that I can't even switch on the television? So here I am, three months ahead in time, suddenly, you no, know, fast forward three months, I'm sitting on a plane on my way to JF Kennedy. And I'm sitting next to this guy. And he's a very nice guy. We talk back and forth. And he says at some point, what are you doing? I'm saying, well, I work for this culture and brand transformation company. And, and where are you from? Well, he says, I'm from a company I don't really, I don't think you know it. I said, try me. Well, and then he says the name. And that's the name of this one here. And I said, you must be kidding. And I look at him and then I'm saying this, can I do the bleeped version? Or do you want to have the sense oh, of you can do You can do whatever you feel like. <laughs> I'm saying to the guy, and I'm not kidding. I'm saying, what the fuck went wrong in your company? <laughs> because, <laughs> and it was just like all my anger sort of condensed into me for about three months of this horrible experience of the remote control it just came out. I couldn't even hold it back. And the guy, of course, looks at me like a deer in the headlight. And he says, what do you mean? And, and he then starts to explain how in this company they had problems internally. You see one department, they was responsible for TV, another one for Netflix, and one was from you know, music in the 40s running 24-7 or whatever he said. And, and he said they had fights about the real estate, real estate on this one. So he said, we came up with a brilliant idea. We separated everything into zones. So one zone was responsible for the TV and one for the other one. And yeah, it meant that you had three sets of numerical keyboards. He was aware of that and A, B, C, D and arrows up and down. And he, it really worked, he said to me. And I said to him, except one thing, I don't know how to switch on the television. And, and this is really, I think, symptomatic for what's going on, that metaphorically speaking, it's a little bit like when you have a bridge. And if you have a tiny crack in the bridge, bridge engineers tells me, you know, the entire foundation is about to break down. Well, in fact, this remote control was and is exactly an example of that. So it may be from the inside out, everything is calm waters from the outside in. It's a complete different story. Yeah, I have that all the time when um, I talk to companies about the customer experience and you, you inevitably, right, there, if you think of the whole, and I know you and I both share this, you think about the whole chain of experiences you create for your customers. Um, and inevitably, there are places where the chain just comes to a complete halt and, and people don't you know, pe people in the company aren't aware of it. Uh, so one of my favorite examples is uh, I tried to send a box of books via Federal Express and I had a piece of paper with the, all the information you'd need to send a box of books. And the FedEx guy stares at my box in complete horror and he says, you don't have a label. <laughs> of course, you know, if you're FedEx, like the label is where it all comes together. It's where billing and personnel <laughs> and remote and everything is, you know, in this label. And this is the center of the universe. And I'm thinking to myself, as a customer, like, do I care? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it, um, it, it, it's fascinating to, to see this because you do feel like an idiot when you are sort of realize that for a second and you kind of feel is it me which is wrong and I do feel we get into that point at the moment I mean I tried the the other day I know I'm ref referring back to flying but you no know, I was actually I booked a trip to Paris and um I went into the online form everything was perfect I went to Paris and then three days days later which is my return flight I went to the airport checked in and she looked at me and she said you're really early and I thought, oh, it's not that early. I mean, it's one hour and 25 minutes before. They said, do you, what do you mean? Well, you are exactly one month early. I said, one month early? Seriously? So I took up all my papers and I showed to her, and she was right. I was one month too early for returning back. So I was wondering, how did that happen? So I went into this online form. Well, in there, there was some genius of a programmer coming up with the idea of when you do your return flight, why don't we just put in those three days you are sort of requesting, and then we add another month just to be sure that the, you will catch that plane. And you can't, don't look at it. If it says the third is confirmed, you don't say third of March instead of February. <laughs> and, and this is where we kind of, in the moment, feel like we're stupid. We don't get it. We're getting old. Of course, you're not getting old, but I'm getting old. But the reality is that's wrong. It's seeing the world from inside out, which is certainly dominating the world. And you have to flip that on the, on the spot, right? Absolutely. And, and we all have our favorite, um, uh, you know, ways that companies have done this wrong. But I thought it was very encouraging that you do 
articulate um, you know, this common theme of when is a great customer experience. And I'll just repeat them from the book because I think it's, it's just very useful for us to think about. So a time of real need, uh, the employee really empathized with whatever the customer was going through and then broke beyond the rules to find a, a good solution. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so interesting, I'll, I'll tell you one of my, my, my airplane stories just while we're on the subject of airplanes. So I was in one of those modes, I think I was promoting my book where I was on an airline's planes like every day at lunchtime for about five days in a row going around the country um, and happened to be in business class, which was lovely. And, but I happened to be in the back like, and so they started serving food at the front. And by the time they got to me, the only thing that was left on every single one of these flights was something like short ribs, you know, which is <laughs> lovely the first time and maybe the second <laughs> time but by the third day I was a little tired of short ribs and they said well I'm sorry that's all we have and I said well tell you what um I'll just have one of the chicken Caesar salads you know that you sell in the back of the plane and the flight attendant looked at me and said I couldn't possibly give you one of those oh well actually I could but I'd have to charge you for them <laughs> and I was just thinking to myself you know um like I mean clearly this is somebody who's a pretty you know attractive passenger from a flying point of view. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this person wasn't empowered enough to say, no, here's a first class passenger who made this request. I have, I'm empowered to, to change it. And what was so interesting about this particular thing was this airline is one that was famous for customer service for a long, long time. And then yeah. it kind of got taken over by a company that was famous for shareholder returns. <laughs> And this is this is this is a very very interesting point you're raising here because when cultures are merging, you do see a clash going on, mm -hmm. and I think very few companies actually are thinking about that. You literally are merging two people's souls into one, and you can be very lucky that they match very well. But if it is a hostile takeover, or if it's just one of those tactical Wall Street moves, then there is a pretty big risk in nine out of ten cases that there is a, a collision going on here. And I think we see that all the time and it's, it's super dangerous. I think my 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 base philosophy, first of all, coming back to, to what you're saying, um, happened in Japan. I was I was um, at a bar and um, this uh, I was ordering some sake. You've been to Japan, I'm sure, and you know sake. And you know, this old lady came up to me. I think she was between 260 and 300 years old, something like that. <laughs> And she, she had this, there was this glass inside a wooden box and it was standing beautifully there. And so imagine this is a glass here. And she starts, but she has this huge bottle of sake and she pours the sake into this glass and it goes straight up to the edge and it floats over into the wooden box. I said, stop, stop, stop. Why do you do this? And she says to me, here in Japan, we have a tradition. It's always to over deliver and under promise to over deliver and under promise. And I do think we are in our sad world where we are right now, we at best are delivering on promise. We rarely over deliver and under promise. And we mostly are under delivering and over promising. And I think the issue I'm, I'm talking about here is the idea of that whenever you are building a brand or a company, do me a favor, find out the touch point where you're most sensitive. And I want to just put this into perspective. So Alfred Hitchcock, when he produced his movies, he always had two manuscripts, not one. He had the blue script, the rational script, that's the props, the monologue, all this stuff. And he would flesh it out throughout the whole movie. And he had the green script, which were how you should feel like the emotional script. And he should be scared. He should be, you no know, feel empathy, all that stuff. Now, if you think about that, metaphorically speaking, where do you have the biggest frictions as a customer? Where are you most in need? Every company would have moments where the customers are mostly in need. Start to focus on those points. Why? Because you are literally a ticking bomb. Most in need is when you are about to board the plane and you're bumped and you can't get on that plane. Most in need is when you're plugging in your computer and that extra most important cable is gone or when you collect your ikea furniture and that screw making the whole matic is for some reason gone right this is the matic and I, I i did work a lot with lego on this in fact back in the days with lego we actually always included extra of the tiny bricks and we did that on purpose to make sure that that big joy of the kids building this castle not working because these two magical bricks were gone was put extra into it so what we are doing is to identify those potential frictions and i tend to say exactly as you're quoted saying in the book 
I tend to say it is in times of need you actually can build your company. That is where typically we as a company owner or operator forget about it because it's just a routine, that little extra plastic brick. But from an outside in, it's the entire world we're talking about, right? That's inspiring. That's really inspiring. And I think we um, often don't realize, you know, I've often reflected on the fact that for a company, you know, a disgruntled, dissatisfied customer is is you know a fraction of all customer interactions. It's a it's a tiny tiny proportion, yes. but for that customer, it it it's their whole world at that moment. You know, and I think that's something that is so disproportionate. We often don't. Um, it, it is. And there's another dimension to this, which I think is super important to have in mind, of course. And that is the fact that that customer is a ticking bomb on social media. Oh, yeah. Um, because you know how it is. I mean, when you're furious and we all tried those stories, we'd be furious. We literally, if we could, would kill that person. Well, I'm just kidding. But at least in our mind, we are in that mindset, right? For a second. And so we take all our anger and we project it on social media. We just go extra mile just to now we want to hammer them. Well, let's say it's less than 0.01%, which is my experience with all the studies. But actually, if you turn people, this is what I've learned. It's so crazy. When you turn around an angry customer to be extraordinary uh, positive, what I've learned is that the amplification is almost 10 times more. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both 10 times worse or 10 times more. It's not like, you know, you're just wasting your time and money. It actually is pretty profound, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's amazing. So, what prompted you to write this book? Because you know you've written many books, um, and and this one, I think I think it's very timely, um, and I think you know it's written in a, a humorous way. But to me, it actually gets at some of the really almost existential issues of our time. Things like companies being run for shareholders rather than customers or their communities or their other stakeholders. Things like the reward systems that you talk about KPIs in the book. You know producing behavior that on the surface of it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Um, so what made you think that this was um, the right book to write right now? I, f I feel, first of all, that we've gone to an all-time low in our society. Um, and I want to explain that in multiple ways. Um, common sense is sadly not that common. Remember, common sense is to see the world and feel the world from another perspective as well, because of the word common is there. Mm. We see it from different point of view. Mm. Because we live in a world with social media, where social media and the bubbles we are surrounding ourselves are so intense and so reaffirming that I'm the right person, everything I say is correct, and I sort of retract into those self-fulfilling bubbles. But what happens is that that muscle, which is called empathy, slowly is fading away. Mm -hmm. And with that, we then have the Twitter's 280 characters, which is just as bad because that relieves the instant gratification generation where I have no patience whatsoever to read more. That means the nuances, the backdoor story, the whatever it is, the contrast story is not there. It's either yes or no. So those factors has meant, in my opinion, that two things have happened. First of all, the concept of empathy has disappeared. And remember, and you and I talked a lot about it, that you know, when we were mammals many, many years ago, the reason why we walled as a species was because a part in our brain called the right supranatural uh, areas in, in our brain, also part of the cerebral cortex, that area actually evolved ahead of any other mammals. And that established the, the context of or the, sin, the sense of empathy. And we survived because of that, because we're able to put ourselves in the footstep of an animal, animal and somewhat predict what that animal would do. But here's what's so concerning for me. You know, studies by uh, multiple universities, among others, the Michigan University shows, uh, and this is, um, I think it's some 30, 14,000, 14,000 students studied over a period of multiple decades shows that the degree of empathy has now dropped 48%. We know multiple studies supporting this claim. That means that empathy is disappearing. And then you could say to me, well, Martin, does it really matter? Well, in theory, not, but there's just two issues with this. The first issue is what made us become what we are today is kind of our undoing right now. Right. And I don't need to say more than democracy in D.C. Right. The second thing which is equally concerning is the side product of lack of common sense is lack of. Com uh, sorry, the side product of no, uh, of, you know, the side of empathy is the lack of common sense. And what I'm saying here is that 
empathy and common sense are very correlated. And my concern is that as we start to lose empathy, we also start to lose common sense. And I, I do know a lot of people take it for granted, but remember, common sense is only worth something if other people are seeing things from another point of view. But if you're not exposed for this, that muscle you need to train kind of disappears. Mm -hmm. So as I started to look online and with companies and work within the companies, I noticed common sense disappeared and there was simply no interest in looking at the world from outside in. And that's where I said, do you know what? I can come up with a bril brilliant ideas, let's say, or do great campaigns or transform the companies. If I don't get the immune system with me, I don't, if I don't get people's ability to see the world through a lens of a consumer, this is lost. This is a lost game. And that's the reason why I wrote the, the Ministry of Common Sense. Yeah, it's a it is a great title. It's absolutely a great title. So yeah, and, do know, and, and do you know what? 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 It, thank you for saying that. And what I think is so fascinating about this title is, of course, it's real. As you know, you no, know, there is ministries now of common sense popping up around the world, which is crazy because it was meant as a joke, but actually they do uh, exist now and actually cleaning up these stupidities going on one yeah. at a time. <laughs> so I, I wanted to get into that because I know you have your, your human to human theory and a 90 day intervention. And I do yeah. want to talk about those things. But before we get to that, um, a concept that uh, I am fiercely proud of because um, my, my good friend, Amy Edmondson came up with it is this notion of psychological safety. And yeah. in her more recent work, she's actually said, she almost wishes she was more aggressive in what she called that. She, you know, she said she really, she, she really would call it aggressive candor, you know. Um, and there are a lot of misconceptions about, about psychological safety, but I think you point out that hugely important in terms of our ability to both empathize, but also to come to a common understanding of what, what makes sense and what doesn't. And so many times now we're just shouting past each other. It's, it's awful. <laughs> we don't listen. Listen, you're right. We don't listen. And if we listen, the other side effect of this is we're afraid of saying the truth. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to, to be honest here and say that is mainly an American and an Asian phenomenon. Um, if I should come up with a stereotype definition here. In the US, because of the legal system, which means people are petrified of saying things as they are, because what are the ramifications? So there's always this constant fear present. In Asia, it's different. It's because of how people are born and raised and culture uh, stuff. And then you can go to Northern Europe, where I'm born and raised originally, Holland, probably the most frank country on planet Earth. You will be told if you're an idiot, if you are an idiot. I mean, and that will be upfront, right? Um, and, and somewhat the same in Denmark. I, I do think the issue with psychological safety and, and, and it's a wonderful theory by me, um, is the fact she's right. And she's not only right, this has become something so profound in companies, it's not even funny because here's the issue. You can't even raise it, Rita. You can't even say it's an issue in the company because the fact that you're saying it is indicating that you are raising a concern and you are one of these rebellious people. So, so one of the things, I, I want to jump straight to a solution on it because... I've had that issue a lot with uh, a lot of our clients. I want to share with you a, a fascinating story. So as you know, a lot of my work has been focused on neuroscience. And we've done some of the largest uh, fMRI studies in the world, spending quite a lot of resources on understanding our rational and our irrational mind. And remember, 85% of everything we do every day is deeply irrational. We don't believe it. We believe we're so rational, but you're not. I mean, falling in love, okay? Get the point? It's not rational, right? In fact, I had to tell you a story. This is so funny. So I was in India doing a presentation and, and this guy, you know, he was Indian. He came up to me and he said, when I asked the audience, how many of you are, are, are deeply irrational? Of course, everyone thoroughly believe they're a rational person and people. And then I said to them, well, how many of you have created a spreadsheet when you wanted to be married, where you sort of you know, noted down, well, my wife has to be six feet tall. She has to have a Pantone color 552 and her last digit of her cell phone number should be 2259. And one guy raises his hand. I'm not kidding. This is so funny. So I go down to this Indian guy. He sits there and, and I say to him, you're kidding, right? No, I'm not, Martin. I just say, well, <laughs> tell me more. So, well, I actually had this spreadsheet, he says to me, um, and I said, are you, still, are you still married? He said, no, I'm divorced. This is the seventh time. 
<laughs> I'm just saying this because we are deeply rational. So coming back to the study, what we learned from the study is 85% of what we do every day is, is deeply rational. And one of the insights I've learned from that coming back to your question is um, that when are we then able to and open for sharing insights, which may be a little bit confrontational and or have a, a, a potential of, of offending other people? Well, guess what? That is at the campfire. I'm not sure you mentioned it. I tried the campfire when I was a kid, and you're sitting there around in a circle. It's kind of cozy. You can hear the birds. It's crackling somewhere in the dark. You kind of feel scared, but you kind of feel it's cozy at the same time. You can certainly trust people, but you don't know if you can. So that's the moment where a person is saying this truth, and then you kind of build on it, and there's another piece of truth, and suddenly we all love each other in the end, right? Well, what we learned from studying that is that, in fact, this is not a coincidence. It actually puts us into a sin mode where we're actually sharing uh, issues we normally wouldn't share. So I said to one of my clients, Lowe's, which is a, a large chain in the United States, I said to them as we were transforming the organization, how do we rebuild the culture? And we actually started to, together with HR, there's a wonderful guy in HR who was actually headed up with me, Brendan Green. And we basically said, why don't we turn the Friday afternoon stupid beer thing into switch off the lights, project the, the, the uh, video of a campfire on the wall, have the speakers playing this crackling sound, have a light on the floor. We're all sitting around in a circle and we tell the truth. And what happened is, as you tell the truth and you have some of the senior leaders with us, that people are telling the truth. And the psychological safety issue certainly is, is certainly somewhat solved because it helps people to get over that barrier of not daring to talk to the boss. So this is a very concrete way of getting around that. And what I'm saying is always see the world from another point of view, right? Mm -hmm. I love that analogy. I love that analogy. So let's turn now to the um, your human to human theory, and you have five parts to it. And it starts <laughs> off with chickens. <laughs> so, so let's talk about chickens. <laughs> Well, listen, there was an experiment done with chickens. They were put into a cage, stuck there for half a year. And one day they were let out on the beautiful green grass. And of course, the wind out, the birds were singing. Everything was amazing. And then after 30 seconds, they went straight back in again. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And it really is the idea of that um, when you um, want to change, I have to change. What you will notice is it's ex extraordinarily difficult. Why is it difficult? It's difficult because you're afraid of the unknown. And I think you and I and everyone watching and listening can probably recognize that during COVID-19, you had to change. I mean, even the fact that we had to wear a mask is difficult. So change is extraordinarily hard because we are afraid of the unknown here. And what I learned when you come into companies and you want to change and, it, and, and the writing is on the wall, this company is not changing, has a serious problem. It may be so blindly obvious for you as an outsider, but from inside, no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And, and let me give you one example which are pointing this out. So for one of our clients, Maersk, which is the largest shipping company uh, in the world that sit on 21% of all trade, we actually uh, had an issue because um, they could not see it for a while. So here's the story. Um, I'm going to introduce you for a new word, which I think most people have never heard about before. Certainly I hadn't. The word is rolling, rolling. Rolling means if you send a container to one place in the world, if someone else is bidding on a higher price to have their container ship shipped away, yours will be rolled and it has to wait another week. And if you are selling flowers from Colombia, uh, it's not a particular funny situation to be in if your container with the flowers is just waiting a week or two on, on the pier at 82 degrees, right? So um, what I said to them is, why are you doing this? And they said, well, listen, this is an industry standard. And they were right. I can't remember the numbers, but let's say around 40% of all containers are rolled, which is a crazy number when you think what? about it. And uh, yeah, 40% 40 of all air passengers not being allowed on their flights. Well, think about the scenario. I mean, yeah. So, so here's what's happening. I, I say to them, why are you doing it? I mean, you're the leader in the industry. They said, well, actually, we're pretty good. It's only 32% with us. <laughs> so, okay, 32% of all people are losing their stuff every week, kind of not losing it, but it's waiting. Just so said, why don't you change it? This doesn't make sense. And I could not convince them otherwise. So this is a trick. This is really important. 
what I learned was start to see the world from another point of view. And here's the way I did it. I basically said to them, what company do you aspire to? And they said, well, we really like Uber. They're really good at simplifying things. I said, great. And this is the important part. I then said to them, what would happen if Maersk bought Uber? It's not Uber buying Maersk, but Maersk bought Uber. And there's a very big difference with that. And immediately I had people, 88,000 staff, kind of, kind of walking through all these different simulations of what would happen if Maersk bought Uber. And of course, they very quickly dreamed up a scenario, which is you're sitting in an Uber car, halfway through your ride, someone bids a higher price. So you kick out in the rain and another person comes in. Right? <laughs> and at that moment, you could hear that penny drop in the room and people got, do you know what? You're right. So what did we do? We got rid of rolling as the first company in the world. We changed that whole handle process. And this is what I'm so proud of. Now, I don't want to take the credit myself for sure. But over the last two years since we did this, the share price of Maersk has increased 300%. I mean, 300%. Hundred percent. This is the largest shipping company in the world. Twenty-one percent of all trade, three hundred percent up. And well, and this is in an industry that's on its knees. Totally. Oh, and yeah. they are through the whole crisis. They've been booming because they saw certainly the customers, you know, the world through the customers' eyes. And I do think it's it's such a beautiful story because Maersk invented the concept of container shipping. They've been around for more than 100 years, so it's so hard for them to change. And I think that comes back to the chicken case syndrome, that you lock into the case, and it's super difficult for you to recognize the need for you to go out and see the world from outside in, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you also talk about, um, you know, even with the understanding there's a need to change, like you can't leap there all at once. And no. you talk about the need to... Um, you know, in, in organizations. So, so the, the metaphor of the chickens is you, you put the, yes. the seed corn. Well, let, me, let me show you. Let me show you. Oh, Don't okay. even fill my stuff because I want to show the fancy equipment I have here, right? Oh, excellent. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Let's see. I want to show that now. I hope it works. Can you see me doing drawings on the screen right now? Uh, yes. You can. Well, so imagine we are seeing four chicken cages from the top. They're sort of standing on a square, beautiful square. And I'll be very nice to the chickens. So I will open the gates here, right? So here's the issue. If I want to get the chickens out exactly as you're indicating, most business leaders will have this two-year, five-year strategy, the 2025 strategy. Have you heard it, right? Or 2030. Right? So, no, it's always got to be a five or a zero, Martin. Yeah, I know. I know. Sorry. <laughs> none of the sevens, <laughs> fours, threes, none of that. <laughs> So the 2025 or 2030 strategy is let's put the corn here in the middle. And here's what's going to happen. The chickens will now look at this corn and it's a beautiful, sexy, amazing piece of corn. It's just incredible far away. So the first thing the chicken will say, my KPIs don't support that. And my bonus is not supported by that. And by the way, what is this manager? He's fired. I'll stand here looking like an idiot. So what is the chicken going to do? The chicken will, of course, look at the next chicken. And the chicken will look at that one. And the next chicken will look at another one. And they'll all look at each other. Look at me. Look at you. Look at me. Look at you. Right? And what will happen in the end is they will all conclude that is too far away. And they'll go straight back into the cage again. So what is the conclusion here? The conclusion is very simple. Don't place the corn in the middle. Place it just outside the chicken cage. And I call that for a 90 days interventions because the idea is very simple that if you can immediately give people a gratification and an immediate feeling of an achievement, then it's much easier because remember that chicken one is now looking at the corn. You can kind of just grab it from within the cage and the other chicken will now look at you and say, that was really a nice chicken corn he's getting over there. I, I want to try that before he takes mine. And suddenly they all take it. And then what happens is that slowly you now build up the path to go towards the goal, which is this 2030 or 2020, whatever, right? And, and this is really the idea of what I call the 90-day interventions. And I do think if I should translate this into a real-world scenario, it's super simple. It basically is implement 90-day interventions, but when you succeed, and this is so important, when you succeed with this stuff here, do me a favor, celebrate the hell out of it. Make sure that people in the organization really feel honored, because if you can make that person somewhere in the middle or the lower ground in the com company feel like a hero, 
then you will also send a very clear signal to everyone else in the organization, you can do it as well. And once they could do it, you actually have a domino effect of transformation happening in the organization. So that's my story about chickens. And yes, I do like chickens as well, just so you know it, right? <laughs> that's fantastic. So you talk about the five elements, which are just for completeness, I'll, I'll make sure that we get to. So the first one is this notion of the cage. Um, and in organizations, you use a lot of what I, what I think is interesting about your work is not a lot of PowerPoint, a lot of photos, a lot of visuals, a lot of imagery, a lot of things to get people's brains, you know, operating in a slightly different way. So think about what you can do in terms of outside the cage, then, then the courage, right? Building up the courage through, as you put it, a series of small, easy wins that create the proof point. Then the celebrations, you know, celebrate the hell out of it. Um, then there's this interesting one that you call check the cage and conquer. And I wonder if you could spend yeah. a minute on that. Yeah, I can. Check the case and conquer is, is really the reality that people are not going to do what you ask them to do. Um, there's multiple things happening. This is, you no, know, Rita, it's something I would love to discuss more with you at some point, because when you give a mandate as a boss to an organization, what happens is that people rarely takes it. And they rarely takes it because they're afraid of if it really is true. And it's always been so surprising for me. Why don't you take it? Very few people are doing it. My experience is that less than 0.1% is taking a mandate if it's a serious mandate. So what I've learned is when people sort of kind of do things, what do they do? They derail back to the default behavior. So they kind of do what you ask them to do, and then it slowly rounds. And I think the best way of me illustrating that is to go back to my little board here. So many years ago, I was asked by a guy called Mr. Majid Alpha Tim in UAE to, um, to help brand UAE to make Dubai become well known. And Mr. Majid is a wonderful guy. He invited me to, to his place and we went into the desert. It was incredibly hot. And he asked me, what's my idea? And I said to him, let's make it cold. And so I did it very simple. I said to him, why don't we create a ski slope in the middle of the desert? And I know it's a crazy idea. It's actually coming from some of our neuroscience work called a somatic marker, something so dramatic, you'll never forget it. It's Antonio Damascus coming up with those theories. So I said, why don't we create a ski slope in the middle of desert? It has to be ski slope. You have to have real ski lifts. You have to have real live penguins in the middle of the desert. And you should also have real ski cabins flown in from Austria. The Austrian part is very important in the middle of the desert, right? Now, this is what's interesting. And as we took this brilliant idea, at least in the moment, and took it to the headquarter, people said, first of all, it's interesting. And Rita, I've learned one thing about words like in interesting. That means the opposite of interesting. So here's what's happening. They said, wow, very interesting idea. But I need to understand one thing. They said, uh, this idea of yours, you know, what happens if you know, kids are coming from the outside and it's warm on the outside and then it's cold inside and they'll fall and they'll get a, a flu and it will be horrible. And by the way, they'll break their legs and parents will be furious. And all oh, those little penguins, this is horrible with those penguins. Now we should change them to robot penguins. And in fact, I have even a better idea. Why don't we change the whole thing to a computer game? Let's have fun in the snow in the desert. And even better, why don't we just create a, a pamphlet? Let's have fun in the snow in the desert. And what suddenly happened was that suddenly the sharp corners defining that core concept suddenly began to collapse. And this is what I talk about with the divide and conquer and go back into the case. When people do this, they do it with good intentions. That is back to the safety clutter you and I talked about. But what's happening is they slowly are diluting concepts and good ideas and powerful you know, directions. So there's two things you have to do. When people do this, pull them out of this mess. Put them on a stage, of course, with their permission, at the point where you behind the scene, this is so important, Rita, at the point behind the scene where you help them and guide them to come back on track, where you scrap the corners again. Once you are on track with them, put them on the stage, in the town hall, whatever it is, and say to them on open mic, hey, no, you derailed here, didn't you? And they will say, yes, I actually derailed. And it was so funny. I'll tell you why I derailed. And they'll come up with an explanation, which is, I'm sure, extraordinary good. And then you'll say, so what made you realize this probably wasn't the right thing? And they said, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I was afraid of doing it. And this is why I overcome it. And here's my solution. And by the way, it works. 
And once you say that in front of everyone else, what happens is you give permission to everyone else to think and feel the same. And once you do that, and someone which is part of the tribe is showing you the way, then suddenly you feel safe to take them in the hand and transform. And that's the reason why that point is so important. Uh, yeah. And what I think you also mentioned in the book that I think is, is, is really valuable to remember is in the beginning of a change process, there's always people, you know, the change champions, right? And the first few people sort of in the boat, as it were, and there's enthusiasm. And then, you know, as you, as the change sort of makes its way, there are all these ripples, right? And then, and then there's this period where it's kind of going okay. We haven't had a big breakthrough. And, you know, I'm really busy and, you know, there's just yeah. the, like the trade shows coming up in three months and, you know, I'll just skip this one meeting or I'll just, you know, you know, I can't make that. And it just kind of starts to lose the energy. And that's yeah. what I think this notion of, you know, lock up the cages, don't, you know, put reality in yeah. place so that that yeah. backsliding doesn't take yeah. you all the way back. So you kind of got a bit of a ratchet going. You're absolutely right. Let me show you a graph. Which, what are you uh, using, by the way? What what program are you using? Some of our listeners. I'm, I'm using a special iPad. This is the one I'm using. Uh -huh. and, uh, what happens is that it's going through a green screen setup. Ooh. So it allows me to, as you can see now, everything is falling apart because you're asking me to do things like that. <laughs> not I'm, I'm using an iPad too. But, <laughs> I, I, but my, normal, my normal way of sharing it is I go through Zoom. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. So. He's, I'll show you what, what, what a little model here was. It's very cute. So can you see my screen right yeah. now? Cool. So up here, you kind of on, on the very top axis here, you have what, what I call adaption. And uh, this adaption is really the adaption into a new mindset. And, and here we have time down there, right? And what, what I want to say with this is that what I've been so surprised about was when people do transformation of organizations they think it's kind of like that right that's the curve people think they're going through well that's completely wrong i'll tell you what the curve is like the curve is like very very slow everyone is super skeptical then you create these workshops where everyone is super exercised and they're really interesting right and then it goes free fall <laughs> completely free fall here and this is where you have to be very aware when you get to this stage here, you need to change the curve. And actually the reality is the curve will then go like this. This is the reality. This is the biggest danger because what happens in that space here is you fool yourself to believe that now you've done the work. Some people move on to something more shiny in that room. And that's where the entire transformation process falls apart. New people are coming on board. What was that project you did in 1800 and something? Well, here's a PowerPoint date. You can flick through it. And that was sort of the result of it, right? So what you have to do is really focus on that space here. And that space is all about creating an internal movement which is reaffirming the transformation in the organization. That's where what I typically do is I go down on grassroots levels. I, I say to people, what's holding you back from adopting this change? And then they'll come with all sorts of different really good arguments. And then I'll say to them, okay, if you are really a believer of this project, and there's always some really hardcore believers, you take these believers out and you say, I would like you now to help me convince five of your friends within the organization to change their, uh, their view about a little thing, to change something which is directly in line with that narrative, whatever that change is you want to do. And you basically go out to them, you convince them because you're your best friend, so you know how to convince them, and you give them some tool to change. And it has to be a little thing, a tiny thing, okay? And once each of those, let's say, 10 fans of yours is now going out to five, we're up to 50. And then you ask those five to do with another five and suddenly you actually have the curve. And this is solidifying or cementing the whole transformation in the organization because it's an underground wave which is working with a top-down approach at the same time. And in my experience, it works. And, and that's what we saw at Maersk. That's what we saw at Lowe's, um, which over the last six years has been through this process. And they are today the fastest growing supermarket chain in the United States, except for Amazon. But what's fascinating about these guys is they literally are reinventing themselves every day because it's built into the DNA now. Now, I tell you, when I met up with them about eight years ago, I think it was, um, they were near bankruptcy and they were really extraordinary 
um, negative about the future. And today you can go in there and you will you will experience the most amazing store ever at the Lowe's food uh, arm of, um, of, of the setup. So it's remarkable how that transformation really can impact the culture in, in, in such a powerful way, right? That's fascinating. That's great. My goodness, um, the time has really flown. This is just, I could talk to you all day. Um, so well, I like to always um, encourage people to, uh, uh, how, how do we learn more? You've got an actual invitation in the book. Uh, I think the chapter, it's a, it's a two page chapter called One More Thing, <laughs> which, uh, which I love. Um, Thank you. You know, uh, and it, it's basically here which is inviting people to uh, give you examples, to provide advice and, and to provide solutions. So are you creating a community around this idea of common sense now? I, I am trying to create a community and, and you can find me in all sorts of different places. Um, you know, you can of course find me, I just wrote it down very quickly. You can find me on martinlindstrom.com. It's a horrible handwriting. I mean, if someone was going to analyze my handwriting, I'm not sure what they will conclude, <laughs> martinlindstrom.com. But um, what you also can do is that you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, um, uh, and all those different social channels. And also, if you, uh, if you decide to invest in, in my new book, and I thoroughly hope you'll do it. Now, here's the reason why I hope it. Of course, you're an author, you want to sell books. Rita, you and I are in the same camp here. But there's a little bit more to this. For me, this is more than a book. For me, book changes lives. And with that is also the idea of that if it's true what I'm saying, and actually I'm pretty convinced that empathy is dying, this is serious stuff. This is really serious stuff. With that, the common sense that muscle we all like and thrive by is disappearing. I want to start a debate. I want to start a movement around it. And the more amazing people watching and listening right now, which can help me, the better. So I do hope that you will invest a little bit in, in the book and hopefully join me in spreading the word so we can all leave that chicken cage and see it from outside in. Break out. <laughs> That's just amazing. Thank you so much, Martin, for spending some time with us. I know you're really swamped with the book launch, but I'm, I'm pleased to be part of the, the dance card. Um, to all our uh, uh, viewers, if we didn't get to your questions during the live portion of this, we'll follow up with you afterwards. Um, and uh, stay tuned for future Fireside Chats and join the Ministry of Common Sense. <laughs> thank, oh, thank you, Mark. You, Rita. Thanks for being the way you are. Right, <laughs> Common Sense is not that common and nice people are not that common either. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued, to be continued. <laughs>